This is a Bible study continuation in the book of Romans, uh, verse by verse. And uh, uh, the last uh, session, the last video, we were in the, uh, the last verses of Romans chapter 1. Um, and now we're in Romans chapter 2. We're going to cover the entire uh, chapter 2 on this video. Uh, so if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, chapter 2, Book of Romans, and go ahead and open up your Bibles. And uh, the Apostle Paul, the author of this letter, uh, will be leading us uh, as we go through chapter 2, and in fact through chapter 3, just as he did in chapter 1. And that is uh, he's leading us that all humanity is found guilty before God. There's not one of us that will be able to stand before God and say that we are holy or that we are righteous uh, on our own. In chapter one, Paul spoke of the uh, unrighteous man. We learned that man is going to untether himself from the, tr uh, the truth of God that man who's uh, that same man that says, I am not going to listen to the word of God or what the word of God has to say. That man who was born with an innate sense that there was a creator uh, who, who came into the world with the sense that there was God. And in through the process of time or indoctrination from world uh, into worldly ways, he gives himself over to the appetites of his own flesh. And uh, that man leaves, uh, 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 and that leaves a, a man heading down this path of, of destructive uh, sexual behavior, which then leads a man down the path of destroying all other relationships which he has in his life. Now, we come to chapter 2. And Paul is dealing now uh, uh, with the religious man who is far, far more difficult to deal with than the unrighteous man. The unrighteous man has a sense of his own addictions. He has a sense of his own fallenness. He has a sense of how he has fallen short of uh, God's ex expectation uh, for him. And you can likely find that man in a moment of honesty to admit uh, who and what that he is. But when it comes to a religious man, he covers up his sin. He covers up his guilt. Uh, he covers up his condemnation. And he uses his religious activities for all that cover up. If you carefully look uh, in the Gospels at the life of Jesus, Yeshua, who was in uh, who who was it that he was able to reach? He was able to reach the unrighteous, not the religious. He reached out to prostitutes. He re he reached out to drunkards. He reached out to men and women who have issues. He had a great difficulty with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, uh, the people who had a taste of religion. Uh, and they used that religion as their defense to get rid of all their guilt and all of their condemnation concerned with, with their own sin. Uh, and so what we have is that we are moving from the unrighteous man to the self-righteous man. We'll start with verse number one. <clears throat> you, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else... <clears throat> For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now, isn't it amazing that you and I can see our own sins being lived out in other people and how offended those other people, be, uh, how offensive those other people become? It, it, isn't it amazing how when we see our own sinful nature and behavior, um, acted out with other people that we have this attitude, well, you know, I can't believe, I can't believe what they did. I can't believe what they said. You know, isn't it amazing that when we do a sin, when you assessing yourself, it's like a misdemeanor, 
But when you have a person who is doing the same exact sin, uh, you treat them like it's a capital crime. And you take the position that, hey, buddy, you better straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and fly right. Um, that was a song made famous by um, Nat King Cole. Nevertheless, uh, notice that this is like a two-edged sword. The fact that I am judging. Now, remember how Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. That's archaic language, but King James. But if you judge, you're going to be judged. Uh, how in the world can you get through life, though, without judging another? How in the world can you discern the difference between truth in your life uh, and, and, uh, and lies if you're not exercising judgment? So when what he's talking about here with regard to judging is that I am up to my eyeballs in sin, and yet I am not taking an honest look at myself. I would rather look at you and focus on what you, what is wrong with you. But the other edge of the sword is the fact that I am judging reveals that I know what is right from wrong. The fact that I am saying to another, hey, you should not be doing this. And then when I'm doing the same in my life, then I am sitting against knowledge. You can, can you see that? I am already... Uh, I'm already going on the record to say that this type of behavior is wrong. And then when I do the same behavior in my life, I'm sitting against this knowledge that I have. Okay, so let's go on to verse 2 and 3. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Now, the religious man is a very curious kind of character. Uh, uh, he has a very whacked out kind of way of making it through his life because a religious man has a point system, uh, which he, he has devised. You know, uh, uh, do, do you honestly believe that if you are at your church every time that the doors open or at the synagogue every time that the doors open, that such behavior is righteousness? Uh, do you really think that adds to your righteousness? Do you really believe that God looks at behavioral patterns and says, well, you know, there's a there's a nice guy. There's a righteous guy. There's a there, you know, look how often he goes to church or synagogue. Do you think that it adds to the righteousness, you know, if we if we do not watch uh, TV or certain TV shows or if we don't allow our daughters or granddaughters to wear makeup or or uh, uh, or that kind of a thing? Yet this religious man makes a point system and he's adding it up all the time. I was at church or synagogue every time the doors open. There's a point. I don't own a TV, but there's another point. Uh, uh, I don't allow my women folk to wear makeup. Yep, there's another point. I don't go to movies. I don't dance. I don't smoke. I don't drink. Point, 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 point. The religious man adds up these points. And let's just say he gains seven points for the day. And then he goes and, and, uh, and a sin manifests in his life and he takes a point off the score. But you see, he thinks that he's OK because his righteousness to sin ratio is showing seven to one. And so he thinks he's doing OK. And so the religious man puts all of his trust in his religious activity. He believes he is justified then he begins to judge the rest of us. All right, go on to verse 4 and 5. Um, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Question mark. But uh, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, 
you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath <clears throat> when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So we initially come to the Lord, we say, I need your mercy, I need your grace, I need your love in my life. And then what happens? We get a few years of Bible study under our belts. Uh, we memorize a few Bible scriptures. Uh, we uh, even quote scriptures in our conversations. We attend some baptisms or uh, we do plenty of communions. You know, we got two or three dozen communions under our belt. And we begin all of a sudden to think, well, you know, this religious activity that we have done, <clears throat> this ritual that we have gone through, somehow now that qualifies me uh, as a righteous individual before God. And this is why the religious man is so harsh. This is why the religious man is so stiff-necked or stubborn or hard-nosed all the time. It is because they are putting all of their trust <clears throat> In their ritual, uh, all of their trust in their re in the religious system, they're putting all of their trust in their organization, and therefore, what do uh, you you hear them talk about all the time? Uh, they're talking about their religious system, their religious organization. But you know, when when you come to the realization that you are saved only by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of the Messiah not by your acts, then all you will want to talk about is the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, and what he has done. And then you'll be talking, I can't believe about his grace and his mercy and how kind he has been to me and how long suffering he has been. But because you do not belong to the organization, the religious man judges you and he deals with you harshly. Now notice in verse number five, it says, the religious man is storing up for himself judgment. Jesus said at the headquarters of his ministry, which was in Capernaum, uh, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, if you're taking notes or you're following along in the Bible, uh, Matthew 11, verse 23, 24, it says, and you, Capernaum, will be lifted up to heaven? That's a question mark. No, you will descend to Hades. Uh, for it, if the miracles that were performed in you, in you had happened in Sodom, uh, it will be it will have remained to this day. Verse 24. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Understand what Jesus is saying here. These people were crazy about their religious system. These guys would, would uh, they would tithe herb seeds. Now, if you have to understand <laughs> herb seeds, how tedious it would have been, you know, to count out, you know, under a magnifying glass, nine seeds for me, one seed for God. They were talking about this tedious exercise in religious activity uh, these guys were jumping through all kinds of religious hoops, and Jesus looks at them and says, remember those guys in Sodom, the real bad guys? Jesus said, those bad guys will be better off in judgment uh, to come than you are going to be off. The, the guys who are trusting in their religious uh, acts and their religion, religion and ritual will not fare as well as the people who were judged in Sodom. All right, verses six through nine. God will repay each person according to what they have done to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immorality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, uh, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the, for the Jew, then for the Gentile. This is not going to be a pleasant experience. Remember, he's not talking about the guy selling and using meth on the, on the street corner. He's talking about the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the like. And I would include the modern-day uh, right-winged Orthodox um, uh, branches. Um, he is... 
Uh, he is talking about the people who throughout their entire lives are exercising religion, which is all that these people are involved in. It, it, uh, it is all about these people, uh, what they talk about. And he's telling them, you are lost. All right, verses 10 through 12. But, the, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first to the, for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. And so there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who have been born with the law of Moses. We call them the Jews or the children of Abraham. They were born with the history, interacting with the law of God. And then we have all the others in the world who have not had the, that relationship with the Lord or the law of God. We call them Gentiles. But all will stand before, the, for, before God on judgment day. And when that man or that woman who has had the law of God stands before the law, the Lord, on judgment day, God is going to judge them according to that law. And for those who were raised without the law, the Lord is going to judge them. So don't misunderstand. He's not saying just do the best job you can. Uh, just be a sincere person and you're going to make it OK on your good works. That's not what he's saying. Um, uh, We'll cover this uh, in our next lesson, Romans chapter 3, verse 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And so, you know, give up the good works trail. It's not going to work. Um, what he is saying in these verses is that nobody is going to get a raw deal. Each one of us, when we walk away from that time we have in front of the throne of God for judgment, that there will be no complaints like, oh my gosh, that guy ripped me off, or uh, he did not take everything into consideration. No, Paul is saying that when God judges, he is going to be uh, a righteous judge, and you will receive a righteous judgment. All right, verse 13, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law uh, who will be declared righteous. God is not interested in ritual. He's not interested in, in you going through religious activity, as if the religious activity is, is what is going to make you right before the Lord. Notice that they have the law, and that law is what they are boasting in. It, you know, it'd be like it'd be like me saying, "Hey, you know, I own this Bible. Hey, I got a Bible here, and look at it. inside the cover. I've got my name written you know, right here in the front. Look at this, and see right here. Here's here. Here's my name, and the Bible belongs to me. And so, hey." I'm going to heaven because I own this Bible. You know, Paul is saying it's not the possession of the law. Uh, it's not the hearing of it, but it's the doing of it. And so if you're hearing the law and not doing it, does that not increase the condemnation? Uh, we've got a reference here in the, the, the book of James in chapter 1. Uh, an old friend uh, used to pray about this every time he would close a men's Bible study. He would always quote this verse. Um, um, nice fellow, uh, ex NFL player, and he and and he quoted this verse. He uh, verse twenty two: Be doers of the word and not hearers only; otherwise, you are deceiving yourselves. And so when he would close uh, our men's group in a prayer, he would always pray for uh, pray for us being doers of the words and not just hearers of the words. Um, uh, so uh, it would be like you telling your, your child or your grandchild to do a task, to do this or to do that, and come back shortly late, uh, later in time and say, hey, have you done this or that? And they say no, 
and you say, well, did you hear me? And they say, well, yeah, I heard you. Uh, and now, you know, that would really, you know, aggravate you because they heard what you said, but they didn't do what you demanded. So all of the hearing of the law without the doing of the law does intensify the judgment that is coming your way. And so here you have a, a group of Jews. They're filled with pride and they have the law. Uh, they're prideful over owning the law, if you will, or uh, having the law. You know, every Saturday they gather in synagogues and they hear the law of God. And uh, Paul is saying, uh, it, it, to use uh, modern vernacular, uh, uh, big whoop. You know, what is, what, is, what, it, what, what is important is the way that you're living your life. I mean, you can't go into synagogue, uh, you know, Shabbos after Shabbos, and then go out and dishonor your brother or sister in commerce. Okay, tough lesson to learn. All right, verses 14 through 16. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, then they then uh, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, uh, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Okay, and so what Paul is telling us, nobody is going to get away with anything. Not you, not me. As believers, this should be a real comfort to us because we know people who owe us money, uh, uh, having said unkind things about us, having been ripped off, and we look at them and wonder, you know, why they behave in such a way. Uh, Paul is saying here, nobody is going to escape or get away with anything. And so uh, you can just rest and you can just trust that the Lord is going to balance all of these accounts uh, when judgment day comes. Now, notice that it says he is going to even judge the secrets Understand, there are no secrets from God, before God. Um, uh, he knows everything. So you might as well be honest with God. And so when you go to prayer and you have not been spiritual, stop acting like you're spiritual. You can't fool God. Even you know, even if you use the archaic language of King James, uh, God sees through it. He knows you. He sees everything. And remember, you know, Jesus said in the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter five, verse 22, it says, for the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. And so if scripture at the end of humanity uh, uh, or in scripture, when God is judging every man, well, who is the judge? The judge is Yeshua, Jesus. And so the Lord Jesus knows the secrets of all man's hearts. Remember when Yeshua Jesus was with the woman at the well and she was acting kind of cute, you know, maybe even hitting on Jesus. And here this mystery Jewish guy, you know, kind of cute, curly hair and, you know, uh, lean, good tan, muscular, and she's likely hitting on him. And Jesus says, hey, go get your husband and I'll give you the rest of the story. You know, and she's probably twirling her hair and saying, oh, you know, I don't have a husband. I'm available. Uh, now, that's not in Scripture. That's likely what, what would have happened. And, and then Jesus says something like, you have five husbands or you've had five husbands. And the guy you're shacked up with uh, at the moment is number six. Then she says something like, I perceive you as being like a prophet. And in that little exchange, at the well, one can see that Yeshua, Jesus, is not a prophet. He is God who sees all. And, and so when Paul is telling us, what Paul is telling us here, that at the end of the age, this God who sees all is going to be uh, the judge and nobody is going to get away with a single thing. All right, verses 17 through 20. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew 
if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced uh, that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So the, the boast of the Jews was that they had the law. Uh, that was what they were boasting about. And they do that again in modern days. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it'd be like boasting that you own a Bible and your name is printed in the Bible. And so that justifies your behavior. Uh, and, and what matters, uh, what, what, does, what, what does it matter if you own a Bible? You know, what does it matter if you have the law? If you are not living a life that God wants you to live, all of your boasting will accomplish nothing in the kingdom of God. You will, uh, 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 they would boast, we are, the fa we are of the father Abraham. And Yeshua Jesus would reply, you are, the fa you are of the father, the devil. Uh, in the gospel of John chapter eight, verses 43 through 45, it says, why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you are unable to accept my message. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and the father of lies because but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. All right, so there's the example. There's a uh, confirmation in, in John chapter 8. Let's continue now. We're in Romans chapter 2, verses 21 to 25. You then who teach others, do you, teach your, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say the people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor uh, idols, do you rob temples? You who boast of, in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had never been circumcised. And so then if you are not circumcised, if, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? All right, a lot of symbolism here. You have the law of God. You have a bunch of religious people. They're preaching the law of God. They have their little circle of rituals and they're convincing all those around them that the law of God is what they need to be keeping. Notice that the religious leaders themselves are not keeping the law of God. And what is the fruit of all of this? The word blaspheme is there. They're blaspheming God. How many of us have family members who have been uh, preached to all, uh, all of their lives by church people, while at the same time, those church people are ripping them off. You know, uh, they have seen church people living double lives, you know, do what I do, not what I say. Oh, sorry, do what I say, not what I do. And so, you know, their opinion of Yeshua, Jesus, of the Lord is, I don't want anything to do with these people or these religions. You remember uh, uh, David uh, who was he? He was the promised king, the worship leader. Uh, he even wrote much of the worship uh, music for the nation of Israel in the book of Psalms. So what does the guy do? He steals another man's wife. He has the husband killed. Now, do you think all of these naughty things could have done, uh, could have done uh, uh, all the things you could have done this, this past week? They, they, they pay, pale in comparison to what David did. He keeps his mouth shut for a year, and finally a prophet confronts him. Uh, David confesses his actions, and you remember what the Lord said to him. I am going to forgive you. 
I'm going, you are not going to die for your sins, but because you have given uh, my enemies a platform for which they can blaspheme my name, that child uh, that was born of Bathsheba uh, is going to die, and you're going to feel some real pain. Um, uh, interesting, Bathsheba, uh, uh, Bath and Bat are the T and the TH are the same in Hebrew. So Bat is the is the um, is the um, uh, title in the house of the daughter and Shiva. You've heard the word sitting Shiva or Shiva. Uh, that's the number seven. Uh, the uh, Shiva, uh, the B and the V are the same in Hebrew. Uh, so Bathsheba would loosely be translated as the daughter of the oath. Um, interesting. I thought I would share that. <clears throat> uh, um, and so um, the child, um, the child that was born of Bathsheba is going to die, and you're going to feel some real pain, and you're going to reap what you have sown, and you are going to feel some real pain. And, and this is what religion does. Religion creates an atmosphere where the unbeliever uh, can tell that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a lie. Uh, it is not true because look at the way the people are behaving. And these, if these people are living a lie, then it can only make sense that the gospel that they preach is a lie. And this is why it is such an atrocity for you and for me to be preaching to our friends and to our neighbors and to our family members and to our colleagues, while at the same time, nothing has shown up as changed in our lifetime in, in our activities. This is blasphemy. And so Paul is saying to these people, you have all of this ritual going, but it has not made a difference in reality of your heart. All right. And so Paul closes verses 26 to 29. So then, in those um, who are not circumcised, keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as, as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you, are, uh, you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person who, who, a person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, um, nor is circumcision merely outward and, and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not the one written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Um, all right, so this is why... Uh, I repeat often in my Bible studies, the definition of Israel is uh, governed by God. Uh, these verses clearly illustrate that, that all who have professed their faith in the true Messiah and made him Lord of, of your lives uh, is part of Israel. Not because you're a Jew, not because you're a Gentile, but because your lives are governed by God. And you remember in uh, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, uh, it said there'd be a new covenant for all people. And it says Judea and Samaria and some of the Bibles, but it's a reference to uh, Jews and Gentiles, all people. Religion, uh, it, you know, is an avenue for a, a, our fellow man to praise us uh, and who look at us and admire us. And people see the advantage in your religious behavior so that they can admire you and praise you and pray for you. But remember, do not seek... Um, do not seek any kind of reward or, or uh, a, a commentary from your fellow man because that's going to be temporary. Your reward from God is going to be permanent. It's going to be eternal. Religious people are full of themselves. Uh, can you imagine what it would be like in heaven if it was filled with religious people? Bragging all the time, you know, it'd be miserable. But when you have an authentic account encounter with the Savior, the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, and you realize what he has done for you, and you realize that he has delivered you from uh, all of your personal shortcomings, all of your sin, 
you won't be talking much about how much money you're donating or you won't be bragging about all of the people whom you have witnessed to. Uh, uh, if you've had a change of heart, <clears throat> you will be talking about the goodness of God and what he has done for you in your life. Notice in the very closing verses, it says the rituals are of no value if it does not reflect a reality of the human heart. Um, it, it doesn't matter whether it's communion or circumcision or baptism uh, or mikvah. Uh, you can walk in and out of a mikvah or a baptismal pool all day long. If you haven't changed in your heart, if your behavior has not changed, then all you're doing is getting wet. You know, and what the Lord is saying here <clears throat> through uh, Paul is if a person is not has not gone through uh, the ritual, the communion, the, ba the circumcision, the baptism, uh, but he has the reality in his heart. His heart has been pierced or circumcised. Um, and the Lord looks at the, guy, at the heart. And, they, and, and uh, even though that they haven't gone through the rituals, if they're living a life that's serving the purpose of God and the kingdom of God, God is not going to look at ritual. He's not going to look at form. He's going to look at your heart. And if your behavior has changed, then you are a true son <clears throat> or a true daughter of the Lord because you have a heart for God. And uh, and your your behavior patterns will change uh, and it will reflect. Your behavioral patterns will reflect the word of God. One who prays, one who talks with the Lord rather than one who is ritualistic one who is religious, one who is self-centered, one who seeks praise from his fellow man. God says here there are two kinds of people. Those who were born with the law, he refers to as the Jews, and those who were born without the law, he refers to as the Gentiles. There were also two kinds of people when we're dealing with sin. Solomon tells us in Proverbs chapter 28, verses 12 to 14, it says, when the righteous triumph, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, men hide themselves. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. How blessed is the man who fears always. But he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. So, what does that mean? Repentance is not feeling bad. This says repentance is confession and forsaking. And then God says through Solomon, um, with them, they will find mercy. With them, meaning confession and forsaking. Then we have in Psalm uh, 85, verse 2, it says, you forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all of their sins. There are two kinds of people. There are those who seek to cover their own sin, and then there are, there are those who seek God to cover their sins. There are plenty of religious people who think uh, they are okay with God because they have not missed a day in church or synagogue since 1952. And, you know, and then they've tithed 12% rather than 10%, and they participate in all the church or synagogue activities. We have these standards that we think constitute a level of righteousness. And these people think that because they have uh, done some uh, nice things, that their sins have been covered. God had Solomon tell us that if you seek to cover your own sin, that you are not going to pro prosper. The way you prosper is to cry out to God for his mercy, cry out to God for his grace, and allow the finished work of the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to do that. And finally, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. So the mistake that the religious person makes is twofold. The mistake... The, the, the patience of God, for uh, they mistake the patience of blood for, kind, for blindness. And Paul tells us that God sees. And second, 
the second mistake they made is they misinterpreted the long suffering of God as ignorance. And Paul tells us that God knows. So you are not completely taken uh, 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 by the fact that God sees and knows everything. Are, are you not taken by that? And yet, even though he sees and knows everything about you and about me, he is still willing to forgive and to forget and cover all of that with the sacrificial blood of his son. Are you not taken by this? And so there is no reason why any one of us should be going through this next week feeling condemned or feeling that that somehow God is angry with you, or somehow you cannot have an audience with God. Do you understand how ridiculous that is? If we will be honest with God, if God, God will do tremendous things in our lives. And so play church, play religion, or get real with God. Those are, those are your two choices. Look at it this week. Uh, there are no other roads to travel. You either play church or play religion or get real with God. Play the religious game and get or get real with God. Which of it, which one of those uh, is it going to be for you? When a thief on the cross said to Jesus, Lord, when you go into the kingdom, remember me. What ritual did that thief do? What religious act? Did that, did that thief do? He didn't take communion. He didn't take baptism. He didn't do any righteous acts. All he did was get real with God. And what did Jesus say? You will be with me in paradise. Why would you do anything else? Why would you play church? Why would you play religion? Why not get real with God, repent, Turn from your ways and go back to what the word of God is talking about. Show changes in your life. And your sins and your iniquities will all be remembered no more. Amen. I hope this has been helpful and informative. And uh, we'll be covering uh, in chapter three, the first 26 verses on our next Bible study in the book of Romans. Thank you. Amen.